We are recording. Welcome to lecture six. Um, I am hoping that today's content sort of finishes the intro stuff on tension members. I mean, I know it finishes it from a from a topic standpoint, but I'm hoping it finishes it from a conceptual standpoint. Because starting Wednesday, we're going to be able to just start doing it. Because what we've been doing for the past few days is setting up the background, if you will, on tension members. And I would argue that we could start analyzing tension members today. Well, if it wasn't for one thing, um, which is sort of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and, and today what we're going to be talking about is a realistic but odd phenomenon associated with stresses at the connection region called shear lag and how we handle that in the specification. We're also going to talk a little bit about slenderness. Slenderness is technically not a limitation for tension members. However, it is traditionally employed for several reasons. And so I want to talk about how we uh, handle, handle slenderness limitations um, and go through some of the associated math. Okay. Uh, oh, let me talk a little bit about homework. So homeworks 1.1 and 2.1 are graded. I know we're in a weird, we're already in a weird homework um, schedule. So today, you actually should have had two homework assignments due. The one that we did last time with the nine failure paths, and then the lingering assignment with where you had to look up properties in the manual. Um, from here on out, not only are we going to have normal homework schedules, but we're going to have normal homework format. No more of the quiz uploading, if you will. I've got my TA secured for the class, so... We'll just do it like we did last semester in structure. So, everybody good with that? I did I did pull the class because I was curious what your thoughts were. And most people wanted to go back to how we did it last semester. So that's what we're going to do. Sound good? All right. Let's do some recap. Okay? Because I want to sort of put a pin in what we've been doing for the past uh, couple weeks. So, this slide right here sort of summarizes the be-all end-all for the class as a whole, right? In the end, we want to size members such that their factored resistance is greater than or equal to their factored load. So the factored resistance is a nominal resistance adjusted by some fee value, some resistance factor. So for tension members, one of the limit states is gross section yielding. The nominal resistance is Fy times the gross area. So there's Pn, there's the nominal resistance. We then adjust it by a resistance factor to get the factored resistance. So we can compute that pretty easily. We then take that value and compare it against the factored load. So the factored load might be 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, 1.4 dead, etc. And as long as the factored resistance is bigger than the factored load, the structure is safe. And if not, we need to redesign or reassess the situation. And Really, when we talk about design, what we're talking about is selecting members and systems and structures such that their factored resistance is bigger than the factored loads. So that's kind of the goal. That's kind of the be-all, end-all at the end of the day. Gross sections and net sections. I hope by now that kind of makes sense, that the gross section is essentially the main body of the member, and the net section is the cross-section through the connection, right? Now, we've got two different types of bolt arrangements. We have parallel bolt uh, patterns. We have staggered bolt patterns. And we have different expressions for net area as a result. But in the end, what we're interested in is computing the area, right? The gross area, the net area. Sound good? OK. So I want to go back to this. So if you've got your manual, Hopefully everybody brought their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual with them because I think by now just about everybody in here has it. So you ought to turn to this because I want to actually start looking at this manual a little bit. And we are going to be looking at it quite a bit today. Specifically, we are looking at a particular section of the manual. This is also the day that I get to point out all the people that did not bring their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual. And I get to do this. I get to take my finger, stick it up like this, and I get to go... Oh, 
<laughs> Hi. How are you? I get to do that. It's on my desk. I just got to remember to grab it as I walk out. I get to do this. I get to do this. Okay. I want everybody to turn to chapter D. This is 16.1-28. Um, because I want to read through this a little bit. So chapter D is broken up into sections. So section D.1, we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But section D.1 is on slenderness limitations. Section D.2, required tensile strength. So this is actually what's telling us, this is the code telling us how to apportion tension members. It is saying that the design tensile strength of a tension member shall be as follows. Okay, And with, there are two limits they've lifted. One of them is for tensile yielding in the growth section. So what does it say? It says that the nominal capacity, Pn, is Fy times Ag. Hopefully by now we at least kind of have an idea of how to look up the Fy term. And we know how to get Ag. So Fy times Ag, boom. There's our nominal capacity. But look below there. Below there, there is these two little formulas. It says phi is 0.9 and omega is 1.67. So... Omega is the safety factor that we would use if we were using allowable stress design. We are not using allowable stress design in this course. We are using load and resistance factor design. So we are going to use a resistance factor of 0.9. So 0.9 times Fy times Ag will give us the tensile yielding limit state capacity. Simple formula. Now what does it say for tensile rupture in the next section? So I, I call that fracture, fracture, rupture, same thing. Um, we have the nominal capacity is Fu times Ae. Well, we can talk about Ae here. Yeah. But, but it's essentially the same format. We take a limiting stress times an area. But what's the deal with Ae? What does it say on the next page? It says that the effective net area is equal to the net area times this term U. What, 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 what's going on there? So that's, that's sort of going to be the discussion point of today is trying to understand what U is. But what I've done here is I've summarized everything as follows. So our factored strengths for tension members are as follows. So if I have gross section yielding, and I want to determine the design resistance, I take 0.9 times Fy times Ag. 0.9 is my resistance factor. Nominal resistance is Fy Ag. For net section fracture, what I'm doing is I'm taking resistance factor times Fu times this. This is Ae. Ae is the net area times U. Now, before we move on from this slide, is there any term here that we have yet to discuss in this course? You know how to get Fy and Fu from that table in section two. The gross and net area we've been spending the last two lectures just talking about that. This one's the one that's new, right? This is the new one. That's what we're going to talk about today. But before we move on from this slide, I want to talk about these phi values. Where the heck did they come from? Well, phi is a resistance factor. What it is doing is it is lowering the amount of capacity that we can count on for the purposes of design. In other words, I go to the lab and I break this table and it breaks at 800 pounds, right? That's the nominal capacity. But I'm going to back that off a little bit. Let's say the resistance factor is 0.9. Instead of saying 800 pounds, I'm only going to use 720. 800 times 0.9. So that's what that resistance factor is doing. It's backing that uh, uh, amount of usable capacity off of it. Because what you're doing is that, that might not seem like a lot. You're only using 0.9. Well, remember, you're backing off the capacities and you're increasing the loads at the same time because you're doing 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. So you're doing both. Okay. Now the question is, why are these different? Why is the gross section yielding value 0.9 and why is the Net section fracture value 0.75. Why are they different? Well, it goes to what these limit states represent. What happens in metal if you exceed the yield stress? What happens? I'm asking. Well, no, say that again. Well, getting yeah, deformed, but what, but what type of deformation? Permanent. Permanent deformation. Remember, in the elastic range, steel behaves like a rubber band, right? You take the load, you apply the load, you deform the metal. In the elastic range, if you let that load off, it snaps back to its original position. 
Once you exceed the yield stress, you lock in those deformations and they are now permanent. It's like crushing the Coke can, right? You crush it, it stays crushed, right? So if we exceed the yield stress, we are permanently deforming the member. Now that sucks. And that is unintended behavior. Imagine a truss and one tension member was a foot longer than it was supposed to be. How do you think that would affect the rest of the system? You've got one member that's 21 feet long and it's supposed to be 20 feet long. That's going to push on all the other adjacent members and cause unintended stresses on the rest of the structure. Does that make sense? So we don't want that to happen. So we are going to back it off. But why are we backing this one off less than this one? Well, this is limited to the ultimate tensile stress. What happens if we violate the ultimate tensile stress? I mean, if we violate the yield stress, we're locking in permanent deformations. But what happens if we get past FU? We're snapping that thing in half, right? Now, if, you know, if, if there's a balcony holding some load over a puppy, right, I would, I would rather violate the yielding limit state than I would the fracture limit state, right? The fracture limit state's a little worse, right? So we back that one off more. We use a resistance factor of 0.75 for the fracture limit state because we say, no, 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 we need to back that off a little bit more for safety. Does that make sense? And I'm glossing over a lot of stuff in the background of code development about reliability indices and how we typically want reliability indices of about three for main members and about four for connections and whatnot. But in a nutshell, for introductory concept perspectives, that's sort of the deal, is that we're trying to ensure uniform levels of safety. But keep in mind, this limit state represents a more catastrophic potential event than this one does. Make sense? Okay. But the one thing that's missing is this term U, this term shear lag factor. So let's talk about that. Why we need them and what goes into them. And specifically, there, there are two terms that I want to make sure that everybody is familiar with. Uh, and that is, what is connection eccentricity and what is connection length? Okay. So let's see. What we're talking about here is the next section, right? For the gross section yielding, it was just Fy times Ag. But for the net section, it's not Fu times An, it's Fu times Ae. Why is that? Well, I propose that at the net section, not all of that area is effective in transferring stress. See, here's the deal, okay? This is a real-life you know, analysis of a representative connection in a steel structure. This is using some advanced finite element analysis techniques. Even something as simple as taking an angle or a T-shape or whatnot and drilling a few holes in it and yanking on it, the stress distribution that you get around the connection region is really weird. It's, it's out there. Okay. Now, that doesn't happen in the gross section. In the gross section out here, the stresses are very uniform. See how it's like all yellow at the bottom? Like, it's all uniform. Because once those stresses have propagated throughout the member, it's pretty much sigma equals P over A. But right here at the connection, they're weird, right? If I cut a section right here, I do not get nice, pretty uniform stresses as I do if I cut it right here. I get weird distributions because those bolts and those bolt holes are introducing stress discontinuities in the geometry of that member. Okay? And what happens is, is that as you apply load, it takes a little bit for those stresses to propagate throughout the member and become uniform. But right here, this is the net section. This is where we're cutting the section. This is where we're defining capacity. And right here, some of those stresses are lagging behind. So that, that's why we're calling this phenomenon shear lag, because some elements are loaded, some are not, and some are loaded and some are not. You've got that shear, internal shear effect going on. See, I propose that we know how to compute the gross area and the net area, right? But 
Here's the gross area. I propose that all of that area is effective in resisting that load, but not at the net section. If I look at the net section, I propose that of that net area, maybe only 80% of it is effective in actually resisting the load. Maybe it's 70%. Maybe it's 72%. What are these percentages that I'm talking about? These are these U values. These shear lag factors are telling us how much of the net area is effective in resisting stress. How much of that area is effective in carrying the load of the member. Now, shear lag factors are found on the next page. So if you turn the page, if you're on chapter D, turn the page, you will see that on the left side. This is table D3.1. This is my manual. I have a tab right here for that. I will refer to this table quite a bit when I'm doing homeworks and exams. If you have a little sticky note or something like that, I would tab this. This is a very, very worthwhile bookmark for your manual, okay? Because you're going to use this quite a bit. Now, um, the way this, this manual works, or the way this table works, is that you essentially look at your given connection and you apply the case that most closely represents your given connection scenario. Now, the most important cases are cases one and two. Let's read case one. I want this to, let's, let's read case one and two, and let's see if we can digest what's going on. So case one, case one states, all tension members where the tension load is transmitted directly to each of the cross-sectional elements by fasteners or welds. So what that means is, let's look at this example right here. So this is an eye shape. So I propose that for, for the purposes of shear lag, we've got essentially five cross-sectional elements. This part of the flange, 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 the web. So let's look at case one. Case one says that if all of the cross-sectional elements are connected by fasteners or welds, then U is one. So for this shape, would U be one? And I would say no, because yep, 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 no bolts through the web. There are no bolts through the web. So what does case two say? All right, case one says if all of the cross-sectional elements are connected by fasteners or welds, Case two says, if some of the cross-sectional elements are connected by fasteners or welds. Everybody see that? Now, if we're in case two land, there's this equation. One minus X bar over L. And that, that's L. That's not I or one or anything like that. That's the letter L. It's, I don't know, kind of tough. Now, those two cases are arguably the most important. The rest of the cases are very specific for very specific uh, uh, connection scenarios. Some of them relate to hollow structural sections like square tubing or circular tubing. Some of them relate specifically to angles or to W shapes, HP shapes, etc. It is possible that for a given problem, multiple cases can apply. Okay? I want you to keep in mind these are empirical. These come from going down to the lab and ripping apart some steel uh, uh, tension members, doing some tensile tests on representative specimens, and fitting equations to best fit the data. So this um, case two expression, if you will, is sort of the, um, how can I put it? It's sort of the jack of all trades equation that ends up applying to just about every problem. But there are some expressions that may also fit uh, the data. So. What you end up doing for a given problem is you end up applying both cases, if you will, and you take the governing value. And so we'll, we'll look at some examples of that here in a bit. So this just says what I said before. Case one says if all the load is transmitted, then U is one. And so what it's saying in case one is that, yes, those stress discontinuities are there, but if you're transmitting the load to all of the cross-sectional elements, what they're saying is that at the next section, the shear lag effects are enough that we can neglect them. But a lot of times in steel design, that isn't the case. A lot of times, 
We are not connecting all of the uh, cross-sectional elements. We're connecting some of them. So, for example, if we have a channel, a lot of times we connect the web, but not the flanges. If we have an angle, we might connect one leg, but not the other. Those are very common connection scenarios. And if we have some of them connected and not all of them, here's our expression. 1 minus x bar over L. Now notice what I'm saying is not x bar and L. I'm saying x bar sub C-O-N. L sub C-O-N. Because these terms have very particular meanings. And I want to make sure that everybody understands what these terms mean. Any questions so far? All right. Let's talk about what these terms are. Let's talk about x bar first. X bar is what's called the connection eccentricity. And the way it is defined is it is the distance from the connected face to the centroid. Okay? So I want to I want to make sure this is clear. Okay? So let's take a look at, let's say, this channel. Here's the channel, okay? This red line here that I've drawn, this would be the connected face, right? So here's the channel. I've got a plate over here I'm bolting into. What am I going to do? I'm going to take this channel, slap it down, bolt it, right? So this back of the channel is what's actually coming into contact with the plate or whatever it's being bolted to, right? Now, where is the centroid for this channel? Well, it's a channel. Centroid's probably about, I don't know, right there? Is that fair? So if that's the case, then this distance right here That's X bar. And so fortunately, for most rolled shapes, the X bar is just a lookup. We just need to look up the X bar value and use it. Okay? Fortunately, that's pretty easy. Sometimes you got to be a little bit careful on what values that you're looking up. Um, you just got to make sure that you're, you're, um, you're pulling the right value from the right table. Um, the, the best guides that you can use are actually these pictures right up here. So for example, if you're looking at the channels, actually pay attention to this schematic. It will tell you what B sub F is. It will tell you what D is. It will tell you what X bar is. It tells you right here. So if you're pulling a value from this table and you go, I don't know what X bar is, look at the schematic. It will tell you, okay? Now, I actually want everybody to turn to table 1-5 real quick. Because I want to show you something. I've been teaching this class for a long time. This is a common mistake that students make. So, if you open up table 1-5, and this is particularly true of a table that doesn't have, um, set for a section that doesn't have double symmetry. So a channel doesn't have double symmetry. Um, I want you to look on the page on the right. Okay, and on the right, there should be a collection of properties. One says axis XX, one says axis YY. Everybody see that? Okay. Do you notice how on axis YY, there are two X terms? There's an X bar, and then there's an XP. Everybody see that? Okay. If you feel yourself for this initial part of the class, if you feel this tendency for your right hand to write down the value from the XP column. I want you to grab your right hand and slap it. And don't do that. And you're like, why? Well, it's the wrong value. Why is it the wrong value? Here's why. Um, we're going to talk about what XP and YP means later. But suffice it to say that this term XP and YP, its angles might have YP terms, um, XP and YP relate to a, a property associated with bending, with beams, and we will explain what it means later. But for now, it is not the same as the location of the centroid, which for X bar, the definition of X bar is the distance from the connected face to the centroid. Okay? And that's what X bar is. So don't use the XP terms or the YP terms. If you do, do that. 
Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Let's. <coughs> I forgot my remote, so I gotta walk back over here. Now, a special case which we are not gonna deal with today. We are gonna deal with this on uh, Wednesday. Is for W shapes, particularly W shapes connected via the flanges. This is, without a doubt, one of the most common con uh, connection configurations that we use in steel. Okay? In order to determine the U value, we do not use the X bar or the Y bar for a W shape. In fact, if you open up the uh, manual for W shapes, there is no X bar and Y bar. Okay? Instead, what we do is we sort of conceptually cut the shape in half and we treat it like it's a WT, okay? And so the idea is that the connection centroid or the, the, the X bar, uh, the connection eccentricity is the distance from the connected face to the centroid, but the centroid is of this equivalent WT, okay? And how do you determine what the WT is? Well, let's say we had a W12 by 30. What does the 12 mean? It's about how deep it is. What's the 30 mean? That's how heavy it is, right? So what can you tell me about this shape in comparison to this one? Well, it's half as deep. That's half as heavy, right? So if you have this connection scenario and you need to find the X bar, what you do is you look up the Y bar for an equivalent WT, one that's half as deep and half as heavy. Okay? The reason for doing this is that from a shear lag perspective, we're loading the element from the flanges. And so the idea is that like half the load goes into the upper portion, half the load goes into the lower portion. So we can look at the shape as if it's an equivalent WT. And again, remember, these are empirical relationships. These are parameters and patterns that fit the test data uh, as best as possible. We aren't going to do this today. We'll do this on... Uh, or in lecture today. We'll do this in lecture uh, on Wednesday. Sound good? All right. Now, connection length. Connection length is the distance from the center of bolt to the center of bolt. It's the out-to-out -out distance, okay? Probably the most common error that gets that, that happens with students in this, uh, in this area is that what they will do is they will tack on this distance over here. They'll use that distance when they're computing X bar. That's wrong, okay? The, the L, uh, the, or sorry, we're not computing X bar, computing L. When computing L, the distance is from the out-to-out -out center of bolt, out-to-out -out center of bolt. So whether or not it's parallel or staggered, doesn't really matter. It's how far this bolt is to how far this bolt is. The idea is that the longer the connection is, the more steel is available for that load to propagate throughout the member. So that's why the equation is 1 minus x bar over L. As L gets bigger, the shear lag factor gets bigger. Okay? Does that make sense? Now, if you ever have a welded connection like this, this is L, this is L, if you ever have a connection scenario like this, which we will do later on in this class, L is just the average of those two. We will do this. There is a reason that you would lay your welds out like this. So here's an angle. The centroid of that angle is not in the middle. The centroid is actually closer to this end. So you deposit more weld closer to where the centroid is so you don't introduce moment in the connection so that when you yank on it, it actually resists an intention and not uh, introducing any additional moment. Does that make sense? Oh. Okay. What did I say about section D1? What did I say about that? Section D1 was the section on slenderness limitations. What does it say about slenderness limitations in the manual? If you go to chapter D. Well, like, what's the one sentence it says under D1.1.1? There's no maximum slenderness limit for members' intention. There is none. <laughs> so
So the code actually does not stipulate a slenderness limit. But are we going to use one? Yes. Let me explain. So if you go to section D1 on page 16.1-28, it says there is no maximum slenderness limit for members' intention. And that is correct. However, I want to read this note. This note says, for members designed on the basis of tension, the slenderness ratio, L over R, should preferably not exceed 300. This suggestion does not apply to hangers in tension. We're going to do threaded rods and, uh, near the end. Why? Well, these slenderness limits are intended to account for sort of the real world aspects of steel design. Um, have any of you ever actually been to like a fabrication shop like a Huntington Steel or ever actually been to a place like that? I'm just curious. Well, you ought to, if, if there's ever a tour of, of a fab shop and whatnot, you ought, to, you ought to get a chance to check it out. One of the things that you will find during the fabrication of steel is actually how flimsy it can be when you're working with it. Like if you have a plate of steel that's like eight foot long and only, I don't know, quarter inch thick, and you're picking that thing up, it's almost like a piece of wet spaghetti, you know, picking that thing up. It's kind of hard to handle during the fabrication process. And if you have a steel element that is excessively slender, it actually becomes kind of difficult to deal with out on the site, okay? So backing off the L over R for 300 has some very practical application. It might not have anything to do with strength or its in-service condition, but it can prevent damage during shipping. It can prevent excessive deflection under the member's own self-weight. It can prevent excessive sag and vibrations in the structure. So even though L over R isn't a mandated limit, we are going to limit L over R to 300 for member's intention because of the other practical aspects of, uh, of steel design. And this L over R limit is actually our first service limit state. It's not about structural safety, it's about our day-to-day -day performance. Now, this term L over R is the definition of slenderness. If you want to know how do we define slenderness, slenderness is defined as L over R. Okay? Now, L over R, L is the member length, R is the radius of gyration. Okay? So what is the radius of gyration? Well, it's the square root of I over A. It's basically just a normalized uh, moment of inertia. So when you compute L over R, L over R is unitless. It has no units. So you gotta be careful from a computations perspective. Now, I remember when I was first learning about steel design, I actually didn't, I had a hard time understanding what slenderness meant. So I've got some examples. So for example, if you have a soup can, uh, L over R, if you actually compute that for the soup can is about six. For a AAA battery, you have an L over R of about 17, but on the you know, far end, if you've got a dry spaghetti noodle, it's L over R is about 500. For Slender Man, I have no idea. Yes? For the bridge project in um, structural analysis, did yes. they have a limitation on that? No, we didn't, but um, that's a great question. So. We were limited, if I remember, we limited our selections to W12s. So what you can do very easily is let's take the lightest section, the W12 by 14. So one of the things you'll find with shapes like I sections is that RY is always smaller than RX. So take that slender, that RY value, multiply it by 300. And that's the maximum length that member could be under slenderness limitations. We're actually going to use that uh, analogy here in a little bit. I couldn't help throwing memes and whatnot in lectures, so couldn't help it. All right. Whenever you're computing slenderness, please watch out for units because member lengths, like truss members, tend to be in feet, and R values tend to be in inches. L over R is unitless. So always convert your member link to feet, okay? Um, for, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, for tension members, for most of the problems that we do, L over R is going to be a simple check and a maybe even a formality on some problems. But when we get into column land, L over R is going to be our lives. 
So it is going to be something that we revisit and spend a lot of time on later. Now, for R, what we're interested in is overall slenderness. So for R, we're using the minimum radius of gyration. So for symmetric shapes, this is going back to some statics and centroid stuff, for shapes that exhibit symmetry, it is the minimum of Rx and Ry. And so symmetric shapes, I'm talking about W shapes, I'm talking about channels, I'm talking about T shapes. Angles, on the other hand, don't exactly exhibit symmetry with respect to either the X or the Y axis. So in those instances, there's actually a third quantity. There's an LX or an, R, an RX, an RY, and there's actually an RZ. Okay? So if you look at the angle section in the manual, like section 1.7 or 1-7, actually look at those tables. Look at the end. There's actually a, it's called axis ZZ, and there is an R value there. That's the principal axis that generates the least radius of gyration. Kind of like using more circle to determine the worst case orientation. So for angles, just make sure that essentially that you're using RZ. Any questions? Let's do some problems because we've been talking a lot. Let's do some problems. So I have here a C10 by 30 and an L8 by 8 by 5 eighths. I want to determine the U values for these shapes. And I want to determine for at least for the channel, does it meet suggested slenderness limits if it's 15 feet long? So we're going to see about that here in a little bit. So let's let's open up our handy dandy notebook. That's another thing. I have a three-year-old, so I'm referencing the loose clips every now and then. Okay. So we're going to take each shape one at a time. And we're going to see what we can figure out. So let's start off with the C shape. Okay. Now I've um, copied this down here, so it's going to be pretty easy. All right. discussion of shear lag factors. Whenever you're dealing with shear lag factors, the first thing that you ought to do is look at case one and case two. So somebody remind me, what's the difference between case one and case two? In simple English, simple language. So remember, we're on in chapter D, 16.1-28, I think it was, or 30? 30. 30. So what is the case? So let's go to table D3.1. Um, what's the difference between case one and case two? Somebody help me out. Case one, uh, all parts of them are connected, and then case two, some of them are. Exactly right. So does case one apply to our channel? No, because case one, for it to apply, the web and the flanges would have to be connected, and they're not. So case two is applicable, okay? So case two states one minus x bar over L. So let's first off figure out x bar. Now, X bar is the distance from the connected face, which is going to be this back face right here, to the connection centroid. So that distance right there is X bar. What is X bar for this C10 by 30? He said 0 0.649 inches. So, are you looking up the X bar? Yeah. And so 0 0.649 inches. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Now, does everybody understand why that value is the one that we used? 
because the distance from the back of this channel to the centroid is X bar. Whenever you look up X bar for a channel, that's what you're looking up is this distance. When I look up B sub F, I'm looking up this distance. Does that make sense? Now, somebody help me out now. What is L connection? What is the length of the connection? It's 11 inches, right? That's right. It's not 11 inches. It's 9 inches. What if, how do we define the connection length? Remind me. From end bolt to end bolt. So from this line of bolts to this line of bolts. This dimension right here, this is LCON. And that's not 9 inches. That's 11 inches, right? Or sorry, that's not 11, that's 9. I need a little bit more of this. Yeah, the connection length is 9 inches, not 11. So don't, the point is, do not account for that. So what is that? Say it again. 0 0.93. 0 0.93. I'll, I'll carry it out one more, although that's that's more than enough. I think I got 928. So U is 0 0.928. Is, is that hard? Hopefully that's easy. I think having a dedicated lecture just to this is important. Now, we're not done because i got a couple other things I want to look at. Let's talk about this. What does this say? Does the channel meet suggested slenderness limits if it is 15 foot long? Well, let's see. The length is 15 feet. I want to get you into the habit of this right now when you're looking at slenderness. What should I do right now? What are the units for slenderness? Exactly. Convert it to inches. So 15 feet is 180 inches. Now we also need R min. Wait, I thought L was always in feet. It is in feet, but I'm but I'm saying L is in feet right here. But here's my point. You have your manual? Yeah. Tell me what the radii of gyration for channels are measured in. That's going to be table 1-5 in front of the manual. Yeah, you're going to go to the way front of the manual with the properties with the channels. This is a great question. I want, to, I want to address that here in a second. So what are the units for Rx and Ry? So this is a good question. So if you look at the axes for under Ix, or for, for the x-axis, you should see an I, an S, an R, a Z, right? Yeah. And then for the y-axis, an I, an S, an R, and a Z, we're talking about the R values. What units are those in? Inches. Inches. And so what I propose is the member length needs to be in inches so that when you do L over R, they cancel out. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. Now, you asked a question that's very interesting. You said, do we compute an L over R for the x-axis and then an L over R for the y-axis? Right now, no. 
for columns? Yes, very much so. Because what we have to figure out with columns is which way they're going to buckle. And the way that we do that is whichever side has the largest L over R. Or actually, what's the largest tail over R. But that's another story for another day. And I want, so yeah, that's a great question. Everybody good? Now, for the 10 by 30, which is smaller, Rx or Ry? Ry. Ry. In fact, just about every channel, Ry is smaller. So there's a reason they call it the strong axis and the weak axis. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. What is Ry? 0 0.668. So, so what is that? What is L over R? So we'll say 269.5. Does that meet slenderness limits? Yes. So a lot of times what you will see in engineering computations is the term OK next to it. And that just means that it's good. Does everybody get so far? All right. We're running short on time, and so I want to kind of see if I can knock this one out pretty quickly. So you okay if I go through this one a little bit faster? All right. So for this one, all I want to do is compute. Um, I just want to compute the U value. So... LCON is the distance from exterior bolt to exterior bolt, so that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. It's 10, not 12 inches. And X bar is X bar for the L8 by 8 by 5 eighths. Now one of the things that's interesting for this channel, or for, sorry, for this angle, is that it is an L8 by 8, which means this leg is the same as this leg. And if you actually look at the, um, the X bar and the Y bar, they're the same value. Okay? So in that instance, it doesn't really matter whether or not we use X bar or Y bar because uh, they're the same. So, so. Oh, don't you do this for me. Oh, I'm not happy. My pen decided to be done. There we go. Okay, so this is 2.21. And so I got that from table 1-8. Maybe I should put that here. So I propose that U2 is 1 minus X bar over L, which is 0 0.779. Okay. Now before we leave, because I know we're running short on time, so I'll be quick. I want everybody to go to table D3.1, to the shear lag table. And I want you to see if there's another case that could apply. Yes. I think it's table 1-7. 1-7, you're right, you're right. I, that's right, because 1-8 is the W piece. Thank you. Is there another case that could apply for this problem? What about case 8? We're in the back of the manual near the spec, so back here. 
You see case 8? Would case 8 apply for this problem? It's a single angle? Yeah, it would, right? So if you look at case 8, which value should we use? 0.6, right? Okay? And the reason why is because we have three fasteners per line. Did everybody see that? Now, which value do we use? U2 or U8? Well, what does the bottom of the note say? U2. U2. If U is calculated per case 2, the larger value is permitted to be used. Again, these are empirical expressions, so this is what fits the data the best. Does that make sense? You started to notice the benefit of bookmarks in your manual because you keep turning back and forth? There's some, there's some uh, logic to that, I promise. Any questions? Here's what we're going to do. You're going to have a homework assignment very similar to this. Do Wednesday. And on Wednesday, we finally start doing some real deal steel design. Sound good? We start with analysis of tension members. Do that for a couple lectures. Then we get into design of tension members. All right, everybody. That's all I got. I will see you all.